All right, hello, and welcome to Camel Finance. I'm your boy Camel, and today, today needs no introduction. We're just going to get straight into it. So let's go. Banking giant Standard Chartered has said that Bitcoin's pathway to 100,000 is becoming clearer. So what is it that they know, or can they just see what many Bitcoiners have been seeing for a very long time? In case you're wondering what could drive Bitcoin's price to $100,000, I've prepared a short list of contributing factors that I'm going to share with you now. First of all, China has started to pay state employees' salaries in digital yuan. This is their CBDC rollout. So point number one that is going to contribute to reaching six-figure Bitcoin is the central bank digital currency rollout around the world. People are going to want an alternative form of money, and this is going to create spot-driven demand for Bitcoin. We also had the US Treasury come out and say that they want the power to designate even non-banking institutions as systemically important. So the label they have for these sorts of systemically important institutions is a SIFI, which stands for Systemically Important Financial Institution. And if you don't know what that means, it basically means too big to fail. They will not let these entities collapse. They will bail them out indefinitely. So this is another contributing factor. We are going to see more helicopter money. Of course, the only way to bail out broke institutions is to print money out of thin air and give it to those institutions. Of course, as we continue to see the printing of money, we will continue to see the debasement of currency. As we see the debasement of currency and the resultant inflation, we will, of course, see Bitcoin's price reprice appropriately. Another contributing factor to take Bitcoin to six figures and beyond is Russia just surpassed Kazakhstan to become the second largest Bitcoin mining power by generating a gigawatt of mining power in the first quarter of 2023. As a result of this, we see the hash rate continue to go parabolic. And of course, the rest of the world cannot sit idly by and allow Russia to gain competitive advantage as it amasses Bitcoin hash rate. As a result, we will continue to see the likes of America, Europe, and the rest of the world scramble to also amass hash rate so as not to be left behind Russia. Keep in mind, the more hash rate the Bitcoin network has, the more secure it becomes and the more total value there is protecting the network. A lot of people say Bitcoin isn't backed by anything. Of course, this is not true. Bitcoin is the only secure database on the planet and it is backed by millions of computers all working in a decentralized network to protect and secure what is the soundest form of money on the planet. Another contributing factor is there are 30,000 people estimated globally with a net worth over $100 million. For these individuals, a 1% allocation is $1 million, of course. 30,000 people wanting a 1% exposure to Bitcoin is going to push the price into orbit. I've got here an interesting chart that you can see. It's called Bitcoin Long-Term Power Law. So here's what it looks like. You can see it's basically a regression channel. Below, this chart explains the chart is derived by taking two bands of Bitcoin prices, a resistance price above the current price and a support price below the current price. These resistance and support bands were derived by taking a linear regression of the historical Bitcoin price to derive a power law. This power law is just a straight line to represent the correlation between Bitcoin's price and time. What's even more interesting about this is the chart tells us that the price will reach $100,000 per Bitcoin no earlier than 2021, but no later than 2028. After 2028, the price should never drop below $100,000 again. And if that's not enough, the price of Bitcoin will reach $1 million per Bitcoin no earlier than 2028, but no later than 2037. The price will never drop below a million dollars after the year 2037. As of today's price, the current upper bound sits at 219,000 US dollars. Despite the pullback, Bitcoin on the monthly chart is not a bearish look at all. There is textbook hidden bullish divergence and it is maturing. As you can see here, we have the price making higher lows whilst we have the oscillator making lower lows. This speaks to an oscillator reset before the next leg up. You can also see this is being confirmed by the MACD wanting to flip bullish on a monthly time frame. And from the one month chart to the three month chart, just take a look at this. We have the first green Heiken Ashi candle with a stochastic RSI flip to bullish. None of this speaks to further downside over the medium term. Keep in mind, for every buyer, there's a seller, and for every seller, there's a buyer. The people that are selling right now are selling to someone. So the question is, who is the buyer that's taking all of the panic sold Bitcoin off of the market? Well, Bitcoin whales, entities that hold between 100 and 10,000 Bitcoin, continue to accumulate over the weekend. The supply per whale now exceeds 530 Bitcoin for the first time 
since the FTX collapse. And continuing on with this theme, the whales are accumulating like it's December of 2022. So people that are selling now are selling to the wealthy. They are selling to the people that have the deepest understanding of the Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin protocol. They are also selling to the people with the highest financial literacy. In other news, Coinbase is suing the SEC, seeking regulatory clarity for the crypto industry. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens here. The thing is, BlackRock backs Coinbase. So it's likely that BlackRock and Coinbase are going to crush the SEC, although this could take some time for this all to play out. Before we move on to traditional finance, I wanted to show you this. MicroStrategy holds 140,000 Bitcoin. They've got 11.4 million shares outstanding. So roughly 100 shares gets you exposure to one Bitcoin. Every year, your asset to share ratio increases as they do the productive work and stack the sats for you. By comparison to GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, every year your asset to share ratio falls 2%. So if you can't hold spot or you want additional exposure, you can choose Sailor over GBTC. It's worth noting there's a slight error in the way this is calculated because this is an outdated number of shares outstanding. The real number is 12.9 million shares outstanding, meaning your 100 shares gets you approximately 0.92 Bitcoin. This also might explain why the top 10 owners of MicroStrategy include the likes of BlackRock, Bank of America, Fidelity, Morgan, Stanley, and Vanguard, to name a few. But over in traditional finance, look, large speculators and hedge funds continue to have the largest net short position in the S&P since 2011. Keep in mind, it's not that hedge funds are incompetent, it's that they are trend followers. They have not yet been forced to accept that the trend has reversed and flip to the long side. But make no mistake about it, both the short covering rally and the flip to chasing a new and established uptrend will provide fuel for further upside in the stock market. In addition to this, we also have the Fed continuing to provide liquidity to the system through the discount window and BTFP program. So as you can see here at the hard right edge, the printer is on even though it's disguised as a different type of printer. The charts are offering a lot of interesting perspectives at the moment, so I want to go over these. Volatility is low, and for the short-term traders, this chart is going to offer a nice trading opportunity. It's either going to break out, reaching a target of 4580 for the S&P 500, or we could possibly get a rejection. Either way, it's reasonable to expect a plus or minus 5% move once the S&P makes up its mind about its direction. For me personally, a breakout above here has to be respected, but given where we are in the current cycle, and I'll get to the charts in just a minute, I think it's reasonable to expect a pullback first before we then break out. There's also a couple of interesting ways to look at the gold chart as well. I've been meaning to cover this for a while. I've kind of forgotten about it. Are we in this distribution top pattern, ready to trap a whole load of balls, including myself, that have to respect the breakout trade above all time highs, as I've mentioned on this channel many, many times, before then resolving to the downside for one final shakeout. You'll notice this would be a near textbook version of a Wyckoff distribution pattern. And if you're wondering why you've seen this before, it's because we used a Wyckoff accumulation with a spring to call the bottom of Bitcoin. It's also worth noting we don't necessarily have to have the push up to the spring. You can also have a distribution that triple tops. But it's a very interesting concept because the breakout above all time highs would trap a huge amount of breakout traders, myself included. Like I said, I would have to respect the breakout and get long on a break above all time highs only for this trend to turn around and upset the most amount of market participants, which is entirely what markets are built on. The alternative idea for gold, as pointed out by the market sniper, is that we may well be in the process of having the shakeout first without putting in the spring. Given that I'm currently short gold, this is the move I am championing. And I know I've shown this before, but I wonder if this is what we see. I wonder if we get one final pullback to 0.7 for Livermore's speculative chart before the blast off. As always, open to all outcomes. That includes a breakout to new all-time highs. That includes the Wyckoff Spring distribution pattern. And that also includes a pullback that has already begun. Make no mistake about it, whichever path we take in the near term, all paths eventually lead to gold breaking through its all-time high and moving all the way up towards the 3000 range which would form part of its first macro bull leg. But now, as far as I can tell, at least based on the chart I've got here in front of me, we have a breakdown retest looking for that resumption lower. Doesn't mean it could not invalidate and push up. All the while we're underneath this blue upward sloping support line and this red downward sloping resistance line, I'm happy to continue to hold this short and see if we can get a push down here before then breaking out and closing the short and flipping long on a trend line break. Given the cycle count, 
for me personally, it's reasonable to expect that this is the top for this daily cycle and therefore we're going to spend the next nine or so days in a declining phase whilst we look for that daily cycle low. As I've shown multiple times, this cycle low for gold also aligns nicely with the cycle low for Bitcoin wherever this forms and for the S&P 500 as well. And that is why, sorry, I'm jumping about a bit, but I'm sure you can follow it. That is why when I showed you here, my bias is that we will have this pullback first before we got to go. And the reason I say that is because as it stands, we are currently on day 29 or 30 of a 40 day cycle, plus or minus two days either side. So it'd be perfectly reasonable from my perspective to see us drop down into this cycle low around the 8th or the 9th of May, a look that would look something like this. And then we can go again. A break above these highs here for the S&P 500, assuming this can play out, will of course force many of these hedge fund shorts. Where are they? Here. Many of these shorts will be forced to cover and flip long because we will have undeniably formed a massive string of higher lows and higher highs. So as of yesterday's closes, not a great deal has changed. As you can see from the S&P 500, we're kind of sideways, but we know the bias is down. NASDAQ, still sideways, sideways for quite a while, still just about above this high as well. So for now, not much more to say about that. The Dow Jones, is this a bull flag looking to resolve higher or are we going to get some kind of double top that then drops down into that cycle low and go? I don't think now is the time to be aggressive, but I do think once we get into that 9th of May timeframe, it will be time to get aggressive. You notice how the VIX kind of wants to backtest this area. Are we going to get a little pop up into that cycle low before we go? That seems reasonable to me, but I am not currently championing a giant VIX spike like a lot of people are. Apple, again, still long, still strong, still above this upwards open blue support line. So not much more to say about that. However, a much more encouraging look from the close yesterday from Nike. Nike trying to get above the local highs that we set a few days ago. So it'll be interesting to see if we can actually do this today. If so, that'd be a much more encouraging look from Nike. Bitcoin, for me personally, it speaks with to reason that we would get some kind of counter trend bounce here that then resolves down into that cycle low before we go again. If, however, we're just going to continue this trajectory and keep bleeding, then we have to entertain the idea that this cycle low is going to form somewhere in the neighborhood of five, six days earlier than the 9th of May. So personally, hoping to see some kind of counter trend bounce before we roll over and go. I know a lot of people are calling for a retest of this 25k level that I've got marked in yellow here, the top of this range breakout. That seems to be almost a crowded trade. Now, it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Technically speaking, that would just be a perfect back test and go. But I do wonder if, given how many people are looking for that, if we see either a higher up low form or whether we will see us completely plunge through that to trap a whole heap of people into selling before then we recover. But this is, of course, one of the advantages of having awareness of these 60-day cycles because we know that if it comes down into this neighborhood and does something like this, well, we know that we're going to bounce somewhere around that time frame. Ethereum looks like respecting the sell signal was a good idea. So happy days got out of that trade for a decent profit. XRP, I think we got out on the low of this wick here. So, so far, that seems to be the right decision as well. As I've said before with XRP, you know, I'm not really a fan of the of the coin. I'm not really a fan of any of this really. But if this thing is going to do what I think it's going to do, which is chop underneath this red line and then break out, I think that is going to be a massive opportunity to long. So I'm calling this out. I'm going to continue to call this out all the while we behave like this. And then if we go long down here, you will not at all be surprised because I would have warned you about it for weeks and weeks and months and months. It's been a little while since I covered the yields on the channel, but as you can see, rolling over. So does this speak, given that we have a near 90% chance on the CME of a 25% basis point hike, at least it was last time I checked it, let's have a look. We're down to 86%, so yeah, near enough, right? Nine, nearly 90% chance we're going to see a 25 basis point hike. But I wonder if the yields are assuming, if they are calling a Fed pause after this, if they are pricing in that being the last 25 basis point hike. If I click forward to June and take a look, you can see that there's a 67% chance that's the last hike and there is an 11% chance that they cut at the following meeting with only a 21% chance that we see one more 25 basis point hike in June. So I wonder if that's what we're seeing from the bonds. So I wonder if these are going to start to price one final 25 basis point hike followed by a pause or even potential cuts to come. 
The US two-year yield, again, speaks to heaviness, doesn't it? We kind of had this breakout, could easily be breakout retest resumption. But again, I wonder if the bond market knows something. It usually does. TLT, I've never seen anything so sideways. It just continues to go sideways, doesn't it? So no recession trade as of yet. Breakout of here and we can start to entertain a big recession trade. Still hasn't lost this big level down at 100.8, has it? Still hasn't lost this. So again, given where the cycles are for everything else, as I keep saying, it's reasonable to expect some downside from Bitcoin, from gold, from the S&P over the next couple of weeks, say, uh, what's, what's it going to be, like a week and a half, something like that. So given that that's true, I wonder if we do see the dollar make some kind of push up or some kind of consolidation in here before it breaks down. But make no mistake about it, I am still championing, championing a move down to the 95 to 96 range. And I would speculate, given where we are in the cycles, that's likely going to come around the 8th or the 9th of May as well. That would at least make sense. Everything would be in alignment that way. Of course, markets don't have to always align. And lastly, the crypto related equities. Are we going to have to pay a stop on Coinbase? As you can see, pretty close to this. So I'm not going to go move in the stops. If we get stopped out, that's what stops are for, right? Might be time to go back to neutral if we do get stopped out. MicroStrategy is still chopping around. So again, not really much more to say about this. I personally have no problem holding this trade and I'm just looking to add exposure at the next 60 day cycle. I hopefully that strategy will not come back to bite me. Riot, however, I might take some of the profit off of Riot if we continue to break down below this range breakout and look to add it back on the 60 day cycle low for Bitcoin. But for now, still holding Riot and Marathon, as you can see, back inside of this range. So not the best look for Marathon. This is at the moment a failed breakout. So I'm going to continue to push this, even though it looks like I'm giving back a lot of profit, even though I potentially am giving back a lot of profit. These trend line breaks, the way I trade is a very momentum based strategy. If this indeed is the low, if this indeed is a higher low, and if the price ends up coming down here and doing something like this and breaks out, then I will have got in near the bottom. And this is how I squeeze the most out of the trades. This is what I'll be looking for. Now, in the in an uptrend, in a big raging bull market like this, you do have to tolerate big drawdowns. You can see here, if I measure this, that was a 74% drawdown. From here to here was a 35% drawdown. From here to here was a 35% drawdown. But if you can get in near the bottom and just keep adding on the breaks on the way up, when this thing eventually turns, when we eventually go parabolic, this is how you make the most money, or this is how I make the most money out of these massive, massive parabolic moves. So it might look like I'm giving back a lot of profit, that's fine. I'll take as many shots at this as I need to, to get in near the bottom. But once I'm in near the bottom, and once we establish a violent uptrend, you will see me absolutely milking money out of this market. As you can see, there's not really a great deal for me to do up until we get to the 9th of May, and then we'll be looking to get super aggressive out of all those cycle lows. we just crossed 900 subscribers, so welcome to the new guys, and thank you to all the OGs. Really means the world to me that so many of you are so kind and so supportive of the channel and like the videos and comment all the time, and it really helps push the algorithm. So thank you to all of you. Welcome to the new guys, and until next time, take care from me. All the best. Cheers. Bye. Yay.